Thank you all for giving me the pleasure to be here with you. Um, some of you I know for years, some others I just know from yesterday. But it's great to be here as friends and partly as colleagues also. I'm not an artist, but I am connected to the uh, area of music. And, but I am here to give you a lecture on, under the title which I call The Art of Survival. You may have heard these words before, unifying Europe is like trying to make an omelette without breaking the eggs. Indeed, the metaphor seems to capture the current situation rather well. In the face of the economic crisis, the European Union is arguably in greater need of political integration than ever before. But the member states are reluctant to transfer further competencies to Brussels. No eggs are to be broken to make the omelette. However, even though the code may appear reminiscent of the current debates, it can be traced back to Paul Lacroix, a French novelist, an artist who lived some 200 years ago. We can learn at least two things from Lacroix's words. First, artists have always taken an interest in Europe. Paul Lacroix is part of an illustrious company of artists of many generations who have been concerned with the idea of Europe, including Goethe, Schiller in Germany, Pierre Dubois, Victor Hugo in France, and I will quote more extensively Dublin and Adorno later on. Second, the problems underpinning the current Euro crisis are by no means new. From its very beginning, Europe's history has been marked by crises and conflicts, often rooted in the jealous safeguarding of national sovereignties. Over the last decades, however, the fate of the European continent has fortunately turned to the better. Indeed, from hindsight, the crises which hit the European continent prior to the European Unification Project may be seen as a prelude for new beginnings, far-reaching political reforms, and unparalleled socio-economic achievements all of which have culminated in what is arguably, despite its remaining shortcomings, a highly successful model of civilization and culture in history. Notably, it has been the solutions past generations developed in response to Europe's crises that have brought us, brought us to where we are today. With Europe once again at crossroads, it is up to us now to make the right choices. And the goal of the Bertelsmann Stiftung, which I am representing, is to help inform these choices. We do that in several ways. I have here the spotlight on Europe, für die Vereinigten Staaten von Europa. We have the spotlight at the book table in English and German. I would like to discuss three themes today. First, I will give you a brief overview of the current Euro crisis, putting it into a broader historical perspective. Second, I sketch out four possible scenarios for the future of Europe and try to outline what the effects of the Euro crisis might look like, let's say, in 20 years from now. And then third, I discuss what all this means for you as artists in order to leave you with what will hopefully be three pieces of useful advice. In a more general perspective, I wish to carry forward yesterday's discussion on Klaas van Egmonds question, how did we get into this mess, by elaborating on the question, how do we get out of this mess? Let's turn now to Europe's crisis. At the moment, we are in the midst of an unfold crisis. And it is a kind of a fourfold crisis in terms that we first had the crisis of the global financial system. Then we had the economic crisis. Then we had the rise of unemployment rates. And then we had the crisis in the public debt. This is all hitting the euro. For some time now, we have all know, uh, also witnessed a crisis in the third world, brought about by hyper-speculation with agricultural products, and there is still a considerable chance for crisis emerging in threshold countries 
as a result of a hyper-speculation with natural resources. But we concentrate on Europe. While dangerous in many respects, these movements remind us of the need to fundamentally and sustainably reform the global financial system at the first place. For the crisis is systemic and structural. We must avoid the pitfalls of easily dismissing what happened and seeking salvation in creating another short-lived economic boost. In order to overcome the current challenges in the long run, we require more and more genuine transnational economic governance. In this respect, the European Banking Union, which was agreed at the last European Council in Brussels, is a step in the right direction. Another set of tools that can help us to tackle today's crisis was developed to a considerable extent in um, the very city where we are today. Uh, more than 50 years ago, Röndorf, which is a district of the city of Bad Honnef, well, I cannot imagine that the city is so big that it has districts, but anyway. <laughs> Röndorf was home to extensive discussions among the then German Chancellor Konrad Adenauer and his Minister for Economic Affairs Ludwig Erhard about establishing the German economy as a social market economy. Today, all European econ economies are social market economies in one way or another, and we must cling on this, cling on to this tradition if we want to stop and reverse one of the most worrisome socio-economic trends in the recent years, namely the growing economic inequalities within societies. Therefore, I tap on the OECD Employment Outlook 2012. In most OECD countries, higher incomes earners uh, earn between two and five times more than the low income earners. In this ranking, the US performs rather poorly, while Sweden and Norway feature as <coughs> relatively good examples. As the biggest economy in the European Union, Germany only takes upon a position somewhere in the middle. As regards to the earning gaps development over the last decade, we witness a rather worrisome trend. In fact, between 2000 and 2010, in many countries, including Germany, the gap has widened, so it's rising. It would be disingenuous to deny that economic inequalities are also necessary if we want to have a dynamic society. This is acceptable and sustainable as long as those who are at the bottom of the social ladder continue have reason to believe that they can climb up if only they put in the necessary effort. However, according to a 2009 survey conducted by the German Institute, Institute für Demoskopie Allensbach, only 14%, one out of seven of the lower classes in Germany believes that they will be better off in 10 years' time. And only 30% believe that the proverb man forges his own destiny is true, while 54% percent believe that the gap between the rich and the poor is an iron law. These figures underline the need to tackle the problem of socio-economic inequalities. Governments must create equal opportunities and support marginalized groups in their way, in their way back into the heart of society. And it's needless to say, this alone will not do to overcome the financial crisis, but it should be a decisive part of the European answer to the current problems. No matter how great the situation might appear to all of us today, I have no doubts that eventually we will overcome this crisis just as part, past generations overcame the crises of their times. Some time ago, the Bertelsmann Stiftung did extensive research to come up with, for, with four possible, if not equally likely, scenarios for Europe's future some of which are currently also debated in Brussels, which, uh, where we see the, the European Reform Group, Barroso, Juncker, Van Rompuy, Draghi, and this group continues to work on a blueprint for a new Europe, at least planning on the financial side. Allow me briefly to outline these scenarios before I address their possible implications for artists living in Europe 
and thus for the choices you may have to make in the future. The first scenario I would like to show is the transfer union. In this scenario, Greece is only the first of a range of European countries that force debtors to accept a haircut. Despite fierce opposition from Germany and the Netherlands, euro bonds are introduced and a European bailout fund for banks is set up, which means that the European Central Bank will assume the chief rule in regulating the European banking sector. Much to the dislike of global financial markets actors, the Eurozone decides to levy a tax on financial transactions. Initially, this tax harms the Eurozone financial industry, but soon the rest of Europe and the US follow suit. In this scenario, EU member states are no longer allowed to take out loans that exceed their revenue unless approved by a group composed of the finance ministers of all member states. In other words, the new mechanism forces EU member states to meet ends with the tax income they generate if they want to keep their fiscal sovereignty. The group of European finance ministers is chaired by a newly created EU Minister of Finance and might be accountable to a group comprising members of the national parliaments with com which competes with the members of the European Parliament. The new arrangements assure that Europe is better prepared to handle possible future shocks to the global economy and as a result Europe becomes attractive again to investors who currently have their stakes in Asia and countries in, rich in natural resources. However, at least for some EU member states this scenario comes with a price. Economic policy will be more centralized and taxes will be harmonized. Investment in tax havens outside the EU therefore become even more attractive to European high net individuals, which forces the EU to suspend provisions for the free movement of capital. At the same time, a fierce debate ensues among EU member states with, with high and low tax regimes about the right recipe for tax harmonization in Europe. Once again, Germany will be, rightly or wrongly, accused of dominating the European Union. Yet, at the end of the struggles in Brussels, Europe puts its act together. The transfer union has materialized and Europe's integration has progressed. Scenario two. My doctor would call it Morbus Mediterranis, <laughs> the Mediterranean illness. Europe's south descends into chaos. The economies of Greece, Portugal, Spain and Italy collapse, resulting in sovereign defaults. The crisis also hits the Balkans, where the menace of a new civil war, war begins to loom. Good news for Paul Lancaster, who could make a very nice story out of that. <laughs> in order to tackle the crisis, Europe's stable northern economies, Germany, Austria, the Benelux countries and Scandinavia join forces and agree on creating a northern bloc with new common rules and more sophisticated mutual solidarity clauses. At the same time, Europe's crisis-ridden countries in the south reintroduce re their national currencies, drachme, lire, peseta, which enable them to make their economies more competitive again and thus to gradually catch up again with other European countries. The northern bloc countries from an area of free trade in goods and financial services and harmonize their socio-economic policies based on notions such as solidarity, high technology, research and development, green industries, economic growth and public spirit. They continue to share a common currency and after 20 years the Northern Bloc is in a position to offer privileged partnerships to the countries in its neighborhood, particularly to the former crisis-ridden countries in the South. While the medicine comes in, the form of severe conflicts among EU member states and partial dissolution of the Union, the Morbus Mediterranean is eventually cured. The patient, the continent, carries scares but eventually is healthy. Scenario number three. <laughs> A never-ending number 
of summits and attempts at global crisis management have failed to prevent countries from leaving the European Union. The EU breaks apart. Nationalists and other populist movements dominate most of European, Europe's national parliaments. Sovereign defaults in many European countries cause dire economic consequences. A very agitated process of dissolution and restructuring kicks in. In 2020, Europe is a patchwork rock with new powerful blocks. Great Britain leaves the Union and focuses on its special relationship with the US. Under the leadership of Turkey, Europe's economically weaker states, including Spain and Italy, turn towards the booming Maghreb states. Freed of its dictatorships, the Arab world becomes associated. Russia rises to the role of an Eastern European hegemon, dominating Belarus, Bulgaria, Hungary, Romania, Ukraine. However, part of the old European Union persists. Europe's economically stable countries which are willing to continue the unification projects, such as Germany, Scandinavian countries, Benelux, Baltic states, maybe Poland, modestly join forces to establish their own Europe. Europe. The bloc benefits from close economies, economic ties with China. Chinese capital owns many of the European bloc companies, which create tensions between the Euro European bloc and the US. We don't know if we will find any survivors of the, this Titanic. Scenario number four. The United States of Europe. The current economic crisis lasts and deepens at least until 2015, repeatedly leaving Europe on the brink of political and economic disaster. Several Sovereign defaults in the Eurozone lead to economic and po political turbulences which undermine firstly democratic institutions and in several states of the European periphery radical left or right wing parties come to power creating popular uprisings and revolts. A deep recession in the US aggravates the crisis in Europe. However, the crisis intensity and magnitude have a cathartic effect. In the medium run, a pan-European movement emerges and gains the upper hand. In some European countries, political parties join forces in order to create alliances that seek to promote the principle of European integration. In other countries, new parties are founded which rapidly gain support among voters. Nationalist movements lose influence, while the EU Commission and Parliament gain influence. Eventually, fueled by massive electoral successes, a huge pan-European movement emerges which advocates a grand design for Europe that foresees the creation of a democratically elected European central government. By 2020, a new federal European state has been founded in which the former EU member states enjoy the role of strong regions. The new European status pursues social and economic policies that promote an innovative and social market economy and a green economy as well. Europe regains its status as a powerful and homogeneous economic area with a new, within a new global order. No matter how desirable this scenario may, might appear as a prospect for our common future. A survey conducted by the Zeit in September 2011 revealed that those arguing for a United States of Europe are still to overcome various challenges in their efforts to convince their people. 64% of all Britons, 42% of all Germans, and 36% of all French still generally disagree when asked whether the United States of Europe are a good model for the future. If we want this model to become a success, we should be aware that, and here I am referring to Klaas van Egmond's lecture yesterday, more is needed than democracy. The process of establishing a European model like this should be, not be limited to our European governments transferring more competencies to Brussels. 
it is equally important that alongside this transfer, European citizens have extensive discussions about the shape of this new European model. It, it has eventually reflect about the societal objectives this new United States of Europe should be based on. Europe is not only about governments. It must be filled with content and life by its citizens. In fact, the rebuilding of Europe would provide an excellent opportunity for Europe's societies to debate about their values and objectives. Moreover, establishing the United States of Europe may provide an excellent opportunity to fulfill one of the key requirements that Klaas van Egmond mentioned in his lecture yesterday to build stable societies, namely to reconcile opposites between, for instance, different political parties or actors. In this respect, Switzerland may serve as a role model. First, on a national level, the Swiss government has been a coalition for the four of the four major political parties since 1959, each party having roughly the same number of seats in the cabinet. Second, on a regional level, Switzerland's citizens have the right to decide on important issues and budgets via referenda. As a result of the latter, Swiss members of parliament are much more modest and oriented towards their electorate than in other countries. When thinking about how to establish the United States of Europe, we have to overcome the hesitation that you see in this, um, in this uh, poll. We have to overcome this uh, hesitation by maybe keeping in mind the Swiss model. Because Switzerland, let's face it, has been benefiting from peace and prosperity for a very long time. Ladies and gentlemen, the four scenarios I just outlined may or may not come true in the near future. That is to say, they do not represent strategic options for us to choose. Regardless of whether this future comes true or not, I would like to draw two conclu conclusions from what I have said so far. Over the, the first, over the course of history, Europe has been shaken by severe crises. The Seven Years' War, the French Revolution, the Napoleonic Wars, the Franco-Prussian War, World War Number 1, Number 2, However, no matter how profound the crises were, Europe not only overcame them, but also grew stronger. One could say that crises are a catalyst for development and change for the better. In a globalized world, this is the second conclusion, where everything interrelates in one way or another, it becomes more and more difficult to predict future developments. In this sense, the age of postmodernity is more determined by contingency than any other period before. It becomes increasingly difficult to keep on top of developments. Still, we are well advised to keep receptive to trends and to deliberate on possible scenarios for the future, even if they may, may seem as unlikely as some of the four I just outlined. So what does this all mean for the artist's profession? What does it mean for you? As you know better than me, temporary engagements Unforeseen periods of unemployment, unsteady level of artwork sales, to name but a few examples, characterize the artist's economic life. Variables as monthly salary, weekly hours of work, and paid taxes are particularly difficult to measure with this profession. Reliable data on the economic and social situation of artists in Europe is therefore hard to find. The German Bundesagentur für Arbeit provides us with some striking figures about the job situation of, for artists living in Germany. In June 2012, around 4,500 people working in visual arts and art handcraft were either unemployed or looking for a job. This figure stands in sharp contrast to the number of workplaces on offer, namely 33. <laughs> The employment prospects for other artists in Germany seem similarly bleak. Six and a half thousand actors and dancers were either unemployed or looking for a job. However, merely 68 jobs were on offer. The ratios are 136 to 1 and 95 to 1, respectively. 
Just to give you a comparison, for the employee working in the IT, the ratio is 5 to 1. It is 20,000 individuals were a job and 4,000 jobs were an offer. Still, a crisis time, but some chance. Even for those artists who have a job, in many cases, the economic situation is still difficult. According to the Künstler Sozialkasse, a German social security scheme for artists, in 2012, the average annual salary of a writer in Germany is 17,000 euro. The average salary of a visual artist is 14,000 euro. Performing artists earns 13,000 on average with merely 12,000 the average salary of a musician is at the bottom of the table. Maybe that is because a musician has so many satisfaction in his job. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe that is why I chose finally not to be a musician, I don't know. <laughs> These numbers are depressing, but they hardly come as a surprise. Indeed, just as Europe has always been hit by crises, artists in Europe have always suffered for, from economic hardships. Rembrandt, Gauguin, Van Gogh, they all died as poor men, and the latter was even poor while still alive. Unable to sell more than one picture during his entire lifetime, Van Gogh was fully dependent on the financial support of his younger brother, Theo. In 1880, Vincent van Gogh recapitulated his situation in a letter to Theo. It is true that my financial affairs are in a sorry state. It is true that the future looks rather bleak. It is true that I might have done better. It is true that I have wasted time when it comes to earning a living. It is true that my studies are in fairly lamentable and appalling state, and that my needs are greater, infinitely greater, than my resources. But does that mean going downhill and doing nothing? However, after having so neatly summarized his disastrous financial situation, Van Gogh still responds to his family's conviction that as an artist he is a failure in a rather optimistic tone. Well, right now it seems that things are going very badly for me, have been doing so for some considerable time, and may continue to do so in the future. But it is possible that everything will get better after it has all seemed to go wrong. <laughs> Van Gogh's words may well describe the line of thinking that today's artists should adopt. They should realize that times are tough and might even get tougher in the near future. They should therefore prepare themselves to suffer, at least to some extent. Unfortunately, Van Gogh betrayed his own maxim when he killed himself at the age of 37, rather than waiting for the good times that lay ahead. Only two years after his death, Van Gogh's paintings were displayed for the first time to a wider public, and the rest, as you know, is history. Chopin, by the way, was rather relaxed when it came to money. I am a revolutionary, he declared himself. Like we heard, and like we sang yesterday, Chopin also said, I'm a revolutionary. And he said, money means nothing to me. With this anecdote in mind, I wish to give you three pieces of advice for the future. What can we as individuals do in face of, the, of a contingent and thus unpredictable future? The first advice is then, don't prepare yourself, be prepared. In my view, the best thing to do is encapsulated in a simple maximum. Don't prepare yourself, be prepared. What I mean by this is that you should not prepare for any specific scenario you expect to materialize at some point 
because reality might prove you wrong. Rather, you should be prepared. That is to say, you should be receptive to change. If you remain open to whatever the future might bring, you will be able to make it through the tough times ahead of us. Let me give an example. Holding, for instance, the belief that scenario three, including Russia's ascent to a European hegemon, will come true, you might be tempted to learn Russian and to forget about English. <laughs> if reality proves you wrong and scenario three does not materialize, this choice might come at a high price for you. Eventually, I think you are very well advised not to commit yourself to a rather specific and narrow scenario. In concreto, keep practicing your English. <laughs> In this respect, it might be worth to recall also the literally landscapes of the prominent Swiss author Friedrich Dürrenmatt. His fiction is dedicated to expose and, unma and unmask a rigid stance to worry towards reality. He says the worst possible turn cannot be programmed. It is co caused by coincidence. When we go from Dermat to the current labor market situation, the advice could be, be flexible. It is such a complex matter we live in. The German musician Alvar Nato rightly states, it is impossible to track logic and decision-making really. And accordingly, this German musician, Alvar Nato, concludes Every individual decision is nothing but coincidence. Every artistic decision is coincidence. Now my second piece of advice is use your creativity. The modern conviction that no pre-established order determines our world deprives us of any feeling of existential, existential security or comfort. However, the absence of any a priori order also empowers us to shape our own reality to choose one of the many virtual possibilities and make it become reality. So my second advice is that you should seize the opportunities that are inherent in a contingent world. Use your creativity to shape reality. In fact, artists have always used their creativity to cope with the feelings of insecurity during times of great uncertainty. Let me give you a prominent example. Around 1900, modernity developed into a cultural crisis that posed severe challenges to some of past generations' core beliefs, such as the functioning of the world according to rational <coughs> principles, the possibility to establish one single truth, and the integrity of the self. The question whether God, as Nietzsche had just proclaimed at the end of the 19th century, was dead, and whether consequently no benevolent providence was ruling the world, became the subject of extensive discussion among a new generation. In the face of these challenges, many European intellectuals and artists began to increasingly suffer from a feeling of disorientation and depressing anxiety that existence might be nothing but disorder, senselessness and absurdity. An entire generation felt that the world was falling apart a feeling we might encounter ourselves at times in the face of the current crisis of the European Union and the global economy. However, these late 19th and early 20th centuries artists managed to overcome their existential anxiety and even turn it into art. They sought their own peculiar, peculiar ways of coping with the new notion of reality, the cracks of the foundations and their surrounding encourage them to pursue new aesthetic forms which were able to account for the new Weltbild and in some cases offered some kind of remedy to their fellow human beings. In fact, the crisis of modernity has prompted two main art movements. First, at the end of the 19th century, a group of artists emerged who were increasingly dissatisfied with the established institutionalized forms of Christianity. Rather than questioning a divine principle as such, their criticism focused on the then prevailing forms of religion. Weary of the church, rigid hierarchy, and its institutionalized and dogmatic rituals, these artists saw their own ways of praising God. Their dissatisfaction sparked a quest 
forgot in other non-traditional forms. Religion was to become more charismatic, more spiritual and more focused on the relation between God and the individual. Music and poetry served as means to express the utmost appreciation for God. Second, an avant-garde movement in the various fields of art, be it visual arts, literal, literature, music, emerged and presented a plenitude of new aesthetic forms. The names of Picasso, Dada, Schoenberg, James Joyce are inextricably linked to this avant-garde. These artists were not only, to dissatisf uh, not only dissatisfied with the existing forms of religion, but questioned, um, often, focus, uh, questioned often focus, focusing on the dilemma of theodicy, they questioned a divine principle as such. Ultimately, both movements pursued a similar approach. Instead of deploring the situation, artists of both movements used their creativity and made the very problem they perceived the dissatisfaction with an established form of religion and the apprehension of a world ruled by nothing but chance, the subject of their art production. Arguably, these two movements are even linked by more than their creative approach. And to illustrate this point, allow me to elaborate on the second movement by briefly recapitulating the work of a German Jewish author who might feature as the epitome of the German literature avant-garde, Alfred Döblin. As a representative of modernity, Dublin, just as his contemporaries, was intrigued by the idea that humanity might be living in a world without God. The vision of such a world led him to develop one of the most interesting theories in European art and to write a masterpiece of German literature, Berlin Alexanderplatz, published in 1929 and often referred to as the German Ulysses. In 1919, Dublin entered the profession of an artist by writing an article entitled Beyond God. In this article, he denied the existence of God rather bluntly. God is described as a ghost, a more poetic phantasmagoria, and referring to Sigmund Freud as a pure anachronism dating back from mankind's childhood. After some paragraphs, Dublin consequently states, we must get rid of God. However, this statement captures only part of the truth Dublin set out to establish. When continuing his deliberation, Dublin realizes that he is both unable and unwilling to part with God. He becomes aware of the fact that, no matter how enlightened he believes himself to be, he feels an existential and metaphysical urge that only his belief in God can fulfill. Therefore, at the end of this article, Dublin draws a final conclusion with re which resonates with the mission of the first artistic movement I just mentioned. It is not a divine principle mankind must be freed of, but the established and traditional form of Christianity. He pleads with the individual to establish a period of religious freedom as a precondition for becoming aware of what religion means to him and how consequently religion must be lived. In the end, Dublin envisages a new form of religion. Beyond God perfectly captures modernity's dilemma in that it questions the existence of a principle which guarantees unity, order and stability while simultaneously admitting that mankind cannot do without these principles. La modernité. Charles Baudelaire stated in this respect, c'est le transitoire, le fugitif, le contingent, le moitié est là, dont l'autre moitié est l'éternel et l'immuable. This very dilemma is reflected in Dublin's aesthetic. At first glance, his most famous novel, Berlin Alexanderplatz, features an aesthetic of pure dissonance, fragmentation and disorder. However, a closer look at the text reveals that it is complemented by a significant counter strategy. In order to oppose the apparent chaos, Dublin incorporates a huge variety of recurrent myths, not to the least from the Bible into his story. 
For Dublin, these myths represent elementary human constellations and are thus, on a deeper level, able to provide guidance and meaning to the individual. Eventually, over the course of his career, Dublin wrote a philosophical treatise uh, entitled Our Existence, in which he managed to conceptualize the new form of religion he had argued for in 1919. So the point I wish to make today is that Dublin and modern, modern modernity's artistic endeavors are exemplary of an entire generation who was tired of the past generation's views on the world and who needed a different meaning in life. They took up the challenge and produced some great pieces of art. In a nutshell, my second advice is this. Use your creativity in a broader sense to cope with the challenges of your time. This will require courage, but as Bertolt Brecht once stated, courage is a part of every talent. My third piece of advice. This is to find a balance between the liberty of art and the constraints of, economic, of economy. Theodor Adorno dedicated a substantial part of his oeuvre to, the, to examine the relationship between the artist and the economy. I would therefore like to draw on the ideas of this proponent of the Frankfurt School, School of Critical Theory to formulate my last piece of advice. Adorno first became familiar with what, which, with what he regarded as a culture, uh, culture characterized by a supremacy of the economy and the deplorable absence of any respect of intellectual products in his American exile during World War II. The experiences Adorno made in the US initiated a lifelong critical engagement with the character and shape of the relationship between society and economy. And one crucial product of this engagement was Adorno's conception of society as a totally functionalized nexus, a nexus that subjugates, subjugates the individuals to an all-encompassing law of functionality. The individual who is degraded to a mere tool in this concept lives under the spell which deprives him of his intellectual and critical potential. Despite the generally critical stance of his sociological deliberations, Adorno clings on to the possibility of changing the prevailing economic and social conditions. In his view, one group in particular takes up a special marginalized position outside of the purely functionalized society. It is, does not live under the spell and thus has the power to break the nexus and to redeem a free and emancipated society, the artists. However, the artist's resistance to the mechanisms of society cannot be achieved through simply dismissing or escaping them and remaining inactive. By no means should the artist, according to Adorno, simply negate the mechanisms of the functional nexus by abstaining from any form of production. On the contrary, the artist must oppose society's functional nexus within the framework of his art. He is to create a piece of art which in turn must feature as an expression of the resistance against complete societal and economic fictionalization and rationalization. For Adorno, art is a vanguard of, for the possibility of a free society which no longer defines itself within the narrow confines of means and rationality. If we follow Adorno, the artist's role within society is on one hand that he is part of society, and so the work of art is part of the production cycle, and on the other hand, his duty is to monitor society and to reflect upon and critically engage with, with the way it unfolds. The advice that I would like to draw from Adorno's thinking is rather clear. Try to find a balance between the liberty of your art and the economic constraints you inevitably face. It goes without saying that as an artist you should not compromise your work. Don't serve other gods, don't serve Mammon, as we heard rightly yesterday evening. However, do not succumb to the fiction or fallacy that you can free yourself from any economic restraints. Maybe the solution can be found, as Adorno stipulated, in the way you position yourself and your work towards society and economy. Art has always been opposed 
to society economy, but make sure that this opposition is constructive and productive. The US bestseller author Stephen, Stephen Covey once postulated the view that might capture your situation rather well. Our ultimate freedom is the right and the power to decide how anybody or anything outside ourselves will affect us. On a more personal level, I would also like to add, choose the right networks in your attempt to remain as autonomous as possible when it comes to producing art. What does that mean? Find the right patron or connect to the right people. Make yourself known and engage with those who value your work. Artists of all time have followed this advice. The examples were fight in history are uh, abundant. Just think of Michelangelo, who painted the Sistine Chapel's interior at the Pope's request. Or think of Handel, who wrote some of the finest pieces of music in the service of the British monarchy. Indeed, over the last centuries, artists in Europe had to turn to quite different institutions in, in the pursuit of financial support. First, the money was with the church and the clergy, which, which supported people as famous as Raphael, Petrarch, and Shakespeare to produce art for them. After that, money was with the big firms, most of which failed to become patrons of arts. More recently, Europe's social welfare states invested in the education of artists and in the infrastructure for the display of art. However, given the growing financial and fiscal constraints, public support for artistic projects is in retreat. I'm convinced that we are currently approaching an area in which which will require you to prepare, to be prepared to increasingly seek support from philanthropic individuals and foundations, most of which will be based outside of Europe. Some figures may illustrate this. Contrasting the public debt with the personal assets per capita in Germany, the Pew Research Center highlighted a striking difference. In 2012, the public debt was about 20,000 per capita, and the personal assets per capita were about 95,000. Between 2000 and 2010, personal assets per capita in Germany augmented by 83%. Just for you to know where to find your potential patrons. And my own Vita might well serve as an example. I work for a think tank which was founded with the money from a wealthy family. Nevertheless, I am able to carry out my work fully independently. Allow me to add one final thought to this. Reflecting on the relationship between the artist and the economy, an important purpose of the artist comes to mind. Artists may well teach our modern working world valuable lessons. In recent years, various studies have described the shift from a modern to a postmodern working world. The modern world was characterized by means and rationality and casual principles. Causal principles. It functioned on the basis of mechanical systems that relegated the individual employee to a cock in a big machine. All that matters was the system's functioning and the individual employee's compliance with the rules of the system. After all, the human being and its subjective view on things was perceived as risk. that had to be eradicated processes of standardiz standardization. Just think about the form letter as an attempt to suppress any individual touch and thus the possibility of an inappropriate tone in correspondence. The postmodern working world is completely different. It is characterized by rapid change, a need for individual performances and achievements and open processes that are unpredictable. Original and innovative solutions to specific situations are in ever higher demand. For centuries, artists have developed a way of working that meets the needs of today's postmodern labor world. Artists do not engage in standardized and formalized processes, but rather they, their approach, they approach their material in a playful, open and innovative manner, which is rooted in intuition and experiment. The so-called serious working world can learn a lot from the way you work. In summary, my three pieces of advice are don't prepare yourself, be prepared. Use your creativity and find a balance between the liberty of art and the constraints of economy. What could, what, then allow me just one remark on the content and the meaning of Christian art. 
What could your art look like when following these pieces of advice? As Klaas van Egmond argued yesterday, one conclusion we could draw from the present mess is that we need to find a center position between the collective, the collective and the individual, as well between the idealistic and materialistic worldview. If you consider your task as artists to encourage society, let's say the financial markets, to abandon the extremes and to return to the center you have, you have, in my view, two options. First option is that in your art you may depict the balanced center as a desirable state. It is present uh, to present a positive model of a society that has managed to free itself from its destructive centrifugal forces. So this is the desirable state. Another option is to ridicule or to caricature the destructive status quo. Ex negativo, your recipient would be obliged to deduce a positive model of society. And in this model, the recipient is given the freedom to conceive of an alternative status quo himself. While option A, to picture the desirable status, may draw on the tradition of literary utopias, option B would be more akin to the approach Molière pursued and Voltaire when demasking their contemporaries. At any rate, the contribution that you as artists must make to the changes society will inevitably undergo will require a great deal of courage from your side. But as Reinhard Mohn, the founder of the Bertelsmann Stiftung where I work, once said, to ensure success, one must face an unpredictable future with motivation and creativity. Thank you very much.